Welcome to our talk this evening. Um, as, you, as most of you know, I'm Kate, I'm the manager of Goring Library, and we've been very excited by this project that we're putting on, and I'd like to introduce you to the person who's been behind this, really, the one who emailed me out of the blue and said, would Goring Library like to have some display items from Labour Hill? And I went back saying yes, and it sort of has ballooned, I think is the only way to describe it, from that to uh, a whole series of events that we've been putting on over the last month for children and adults for our local community. So it's a great pleasure, I'd like to introduce you to Angie, who's the creator of archaeology for, for OCC. Yeah, that's yes, yeah. OCC. And she's come all the way from Chapman um, to be with us this evening and tell us a bit more. And also we've got, um, I'm afraid we say we've got Sonna and Songme, who are the two research students who are doing a PhD at Reading University. And um, Summer's going to do some of the talk as well this evening. So I'd like to welcome them this evening to Gorin. Thank you. So, well, thank you very much. Um, I might have been behind the start of this project, but to be honest, between Kate and the friends of Gorin Library, you've absolutely run with it. I never thought we'd have a month long programme of events, a um, month long exhibition. A talk that sort of sold out and we're thinking of repeating it again in February. So it's just like, wow. <laughs> yeah, so well, thank you very much for your enthusiasm <laughs> and coming along. So this evening, Summer is going to give uh, the bulk of the um, lecture um, about the research and the sort of Lowbury Hill and the mystery of Lowbury Hill and Lowbury Man and Lowbury Woman. Um, and then after, I'll give a a short presentation about the objects and the finds that the museum service have in our collection from Lowbury Hill. But of course you can see some of them on display at Goring Library. So if you haven't seen it already, you can then go back to the library and it will make a bit of sense what you're looking at. Okay. But first of all, let's hand over to Summer. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Well, firstly, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to give this talk. I've been pretty excited about it all week, so hopefully you enjoy receiving it as much as I'm going to enjoy giving it. Um, I wanted to start with a little bit about me, since most of you don't know me. I think I see about four familiar faces in the room, so it's a bit nerve-wracking. So my name is Summer. I'm just starting my second year of my PhD at the University of Reading. Um, as you can see, we've got a lot of logos. My research is a collaborative doctoral award funded by the South, West, and Wales Doctoral Funding Partnership. So I'm working not only with Reading University, but also with the Oxford Street Museum Services and Cranford University. So you'll hear a lot of back and forth about why we're doing some of this and why it's a collaborative award. Um, today, we've got Amy Smith, my primary advisor, who's here, who'll be doing something for us later. We've got Angie Bolton, who is here, who's my other supervisor of mine, and Sophie Beckett is our, my Cranfield supervisor, but she couldn't be here today. So she'll get to watch the video at some of our online audience. Um, so my research is partnering with Songmies, but it's a little bit different. I'm seeking to reassess the Roman and early medieval or Anglo-Saxon site at Lowbury Hill to better understand its use, whether it's a temple or otherwise, um, its longevity and its importance in the local landscape. I'll also be reinterpreting the Lowbury Lady and the Lowbury, Ma Lowbury Man, who many of you are here, here about tonight. Um, we're hoping to get a greater understanding of why she was buried there and how her burial relates both to his burial and to the wider site and the surrounding landscape. Um, before we start off in earnest, however, I want to take just a few minutes to bring your attention to some of the fallacies in the title of the advertised lecture. Firstly, over the next 45 minutes, we're going to cover much more than a century of research. We're actually galloping through somewhere in the neighborhood of 160 years of academic research. And we're also looking past the academy and into the ways that locals like yourselves and other people have interpreted Lowbury Hill, how they've used it, how it's powered art, how it's been the focus of people from kings down to researchers like myself, to artists like Anna, who's here today, who've Many of her paintings will feature, so you'll see plenty of those, and from antiquarians. So now that we've uh, covered that, we can get into the presentation in earnest. So, Lowbury Hill, which is here on the map, which I've stolen from Amy, quite kindly. Um, I'm sure I saw it from Google. It's <laughs> a prominent hill in Oxfordshire, just beyond Asson Gerald and Asson Upthorpe, and in fact, Goring. 
and is the highest point on the eastern Berkshire Downs, with a peak standing about 186 meters above sea level. Uh, it is worth noting at this juncture that Lowbury Hill, though now part of Oxfordshire, was part of Berkshire until 1974. So quite a few of our later slides will talk about Lowbury Hill as part of Berkshire, not Oxfordshire. Um, on a more local scale, you'll have noticed that Goring is indeed on the map right here. So you are extremely close to Lowbury Hill. Um, since the site was designated as scheduled monument, the known archaeological extent of the hilltop has been protected. I'm sure many of you already know this. So there's no plowing anymore, there's no metal detecting, and no other possibly invasive activities. Uh, though it is now used quite regularly for seasonal grazing, uh, it is still accessible by foot, and it's a wonderful destination for a picnic. And with good weather, you can actually see seven counties, which I didn't know until Anna and Heather took me up there. So the seven you can see are Berkshire, Hampshire, Wiltshire, Gloucestershire, Oxfordshire, Northamptonshire, and Buckinghamshire, all from the hilltop if you do a nice big circle and the sky is clear. <coughs> so we've got here an image by Headley, um, but we'll start before that with the name of Lowbury. So Lowbury wasn't always called Lowbury, but we'll come back to that. The name that we do use today, Lowbury Hill, comes from the Old English, so Hloch and Burr, or as we see a lot in place names around the country, words which identify the barrow and the Roman structure respectively. Now, this image, as I said, taken by Headley Thorne, who couldn't be here today, shows these two main archaeological features extremely clearly. It's a beautiful image. So, the raised structure here in the midground, that's the Anglo Saxon or early medieval barrow that we're talking about throughout this talk. In the background, this big square is the Roman enclosure. And here is a ring ditch. Now, this ring ditch um, is not much documented. In fact, the only reference I could find to it, other than this photo, was from the 1950s RA, RA photos that we've got, which I haven't been able to access just yet. Hopefully we'll have them, and it should be that ring ditch, but it could be something else. Um, it's not been subject to any archaeological exploration just yet. Hopefully in future we'll get to look at it with some geophysics and see a better idea of what it is and when it is in time. Now, as I alluded, Lowbury Hill wasn't always called Lowbury Hill, and some of you probably already know this, but uh, throughout the 19th and early 20th century, a lot of locals referred to Lowbury Hill as Oyster Hill because of the huge number of oyster shells found in the site. Now, I've included this mosaic floor, which has a Roman depiction of an oyster, though it's not even from Britain, it's uh, North African. But it's a beautiful oyster, so I thought we'd bring it in here today. Um, that said, oysters weren't the only thing eroding from the hilltop. In 1844, William Hewitt published the history and antiquities of the 100 Compton Barks and interpreted the site as a Roman military camp on the basis of coins and possible tessera found by the eagle-eyed antiquarians of the day. Now, tessera <coughs> refer to these little square bits, usually of stone, but also of glass and other materials that are used to make floor and lays, and sometimes walls, but usually floors. Um, now, these finds are lost. We haven't been able to track them down. Uh, they're probably in someone's home or in a box in a museum as of yet unlabeled, unfortunately. Um, and I suspect that the things that they were calling tessera probably weren't tessera, because we haven't found any more of them. No one has found any further tessera, and we usually expect to find loads as they were used to flooring. Um, that said, that didn't stop anyone interpreting the site as a Roman military camp. Uh, with tessera that, weren't, that were maybe found, were theoretically used to pave the flooring of the commander's tent. Now we haven't found a tent, we haven't found a floor, and uh, there's no evidence for a camp. But throughout the 19th century, that's what we believe, hence our uh, nice friend here which is a Roman soldier's tombstone from York. Now, now we're on to the actual academic recent research-ish. Um, the first documented invasive investigation on the site was undertaken in 1859 by Mr. R. H. Valpy, the landowner at the time. Now, note, I referred to his excavation or his work as invasive, not archaeological. Um, and that's an important distinction, because antiquarians like Mr. Valby, though invaluable for the development of British archaeology, 
really damaged the sites that they were investigating more often than not, unfortunately. Um, during the course of his works, Mr. Balby dug down into the barrow, which we looked at earlier, on the site. He was really hoping to discover the Lowbury man. Fortunately for us, he missed him entirely. <laughs> um, we did find were some Roman coins and some wood ash. Um, these images, which this one here, is by the lovely Anna Dillon, who's here with us today, um, and shows the bears in beautiful, beautiful foreground here, very visible. And this is a LIDAR image from an uh, environment agency. And LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. It's one of the ways that we find archaeological sites. They both show the barrow, and I put them here to show really what we could have lost had Mr. Valby been, A, more enthusiastic and more successful in his excavations, and we're quite lucky that he <coughs> wasn't as lucky as he would have hoped to have been. Now, the first archaeological excavation was led in 1913 and 14 by Donald Atkinson, at the time a research fellow in the classes department at the University of Reading. So his excavation, which was the first one that we consider truly archaeological in nature, investigated the Roman enclosure, which is this big, giant rectangle here, um, as well as the barrow, and two other sites, only one of them was on this drawing, which didn't yield much of archaeological interest. Um, alongside uncovering the remains of the enclosure wall, he discovered a wide range of finds, some of which Angel will talk about later, so we won't talk about them too much now. But they include roof tiles and daub as building materials, coins, agricultural tools, weapons, and as a personal adornment, so jewelry like the ones I'm wearing today. Um, and he also discovered two burials. Now, the first was in the line of the Roman wall. It highlighted her here. That's Mrs. Lowe, our Lowbury lady. And then here in the barrow, is uh, Mr. Lowe, our Lowbury man. And Atkinson was the first one to find both of them. The first of these bears, as we said, is our Lowbury lady. She was interpreted by Atkinson as an older adult woman who was the victim of Roman, a Roman period human sacrifice meant to bless the enclosure wall. She was buried lying on her back, orientated east-west, with her head towards the west. And she was buried without any grave goods. Now, our male, back over here, as we might have seen in the museum, Woodstock, uh, is an older adult male. Some popularly referred to him as Mr. Lowe, a Lowbury man. He was found also lying on his back, both his head towards the south, and his grave contained a huge variety of grave goods. He had a sword, a shield, an enameled spearhead, a knife, miniature shears, a bronze hanging bowl, a bone comb, and various other buckles which would have held these items A on his clothing and buckle his clothing. Um, so his location in this beautiful barrow led Atkinson to dub him Anglo-Saxon warlord, which we keep hearing and we'll hear about a little more. Um, now, on the basis of Atkinson's finds <coughs> for the site, and especially agricultural tools, just like this ox goat here, of which several were found at Lowbury Hill, and this one isn't at Lowbury Hill, Atkinson determined the site probably served as a Roman upland farm, with a series of buildings organized along the interior of that wall, leaving the central area clear. And he suggested that towards the end of the Roman period in Britain, um, just prior to 410, this site would have served as a fortified settlement, which would have fallen to the Anglo-Saxon later, including Mr. Lowe. Um, which is a quite fun narrative. But he wasn't the only one to think that Lowbury Hill might have had an agricultural nature. Um, in 1934, so several years later, Huntingford suggested that Lowbury Hill serve as an upland cattle enclosure, hence our friend here. <laughs> um, whilst Atkinson and Huntingford's interpretation of the site have largely been dismissed in more recent research, the site is still active agricultural land. And Mr. Walters, who's a tenant farmer there now, uses the site for grazing, and the hill, the slopes of the hill on all sides, are regularly planted with crops. Though we haven't found much archaeology, there's just not too much of a worry, they're not scheduled, it's fine. But it is worth noting that this land has always had at least some agricultural function, and there are some field boundaries there as well that predate the Roman side, 
So you think that this was being used for farming for the entire time, basically, on and off at least. Now, by 1956, the agriculture and chiptons at the site had started to fall out of vogue. It wasn't as interesting to be a farmer anymore. Um, and Mowbray Hill was just beginning to be interpreted as a temple, which a lot of you will have heard about and heard it called a temple. Um, this began really in earnest with the third edition of the OS map of Roman Britain, where in Lowbury Hill is listed as a Roman temple for the first time. They don't offer any justification for this in the text. It's just listed as a temple. Um, that said, the OS, um, or Ordnance Survey Office rather, did publish a book around about the same time called Field Archaeology, Some Notes for Amateurs, which says you might be able to identify temples and sanctuaries and rural altars by the finds you might find at the site during these field walking events. Um, and they suggest that in particular, large numbers of items that we should personal adornment. So like the brooch here and the ring here, again, neither of which are from Lowbury Hill, might be one way to identify a rural site. Um, they also suggested that coins, like you've got in the middle, could be another way to identify a rural temple. There were lots of them, we weren't expecting them. So from this point forward, Lowbury Hill was beginning to be accepted as a temple, but it wasn't until Davy studied the coins from the site that we had really any true justification or reason to call it a temple beyond there were some finds we didn't expect to find. Um, so his study highlighted the parallels of the number and types of coins from Lowbury Hill in comparison with known temple sites where a temple building had been found at Lydney in Gloucestershire and Nettleton in Wiltshire. Now, that held for quite a long time, but just now we're beginning to accept that Davy's methodology was a little flawed. Um, and all coins can tell us a lot about a site, when it was used, potentially the amount of wealth in the area of people who were using it, they can't really be used to identify a site's function. Um, instead, the types and patterns of coins that are lost at a site just tell us about the coins that were available at the time it was being used and by the people who were using it. So not quite identification anymore. Now, do this changing narrative of what the site might be, as well as plow and erosion damage, to the hilltop, a decision was made to reevaluate the enclosure and the barrow in 1992. And this is our second archaeological dig at Lowbury. Now, this second expedition was led by Mike Fulford and Stephen Rippon, who were at the time both at the University of Reading. Mike Fulford is still with us, and we're very lucky to have him. Um, this dig went a little bit beyond what Atkinson had done, because it used geophysical survey techniques to survey the site and did a limited um, excavation. So neither these geophysics nor the excavation revealed any evidence for an internal structure. So we still haven't found that temple. Um, they did find some more of the building material that Atkinson had found, some more roof tile, no more daub though. Um, and they found a small subset of the material mirroring what Atkinson had found. So we've got some rings here and there. We've got another brooch, and we've got some pins. This is all that personal adornment that was being used to identify the site as a temple. We, we, we found more, which is quite nice, but it doesn't really tell us what the site does. Um, but, and really excitingly for me, during this dig, they found an, an area of intact stratigraphy along the enclosure wall near where the Lowbury Lady was buried. Now, stratigraphy, that is the sequence of soil or earth layers deposited by humans and or natural action through time, is what we archaeologists use to discover the history of a site, when things happened, how they might have happened. Um, and that intact stratigraphy showed that the Roman enclosure wall had been robbed out. That is, the stones had been taken out of the foundation and a ditch had been left, presumably. Um, and it was within that We've seen that, that Atkinson and Fulford thought to themselves, Atkinson, Riffin and Fulford thought to themselves, maybe this woman isn't Roman. What if she was buried in this ditch that was left by robbing the wall? So they tested this theory, radiocarbon dating, which confirmed the Lowbury lady isn't Roman. She 
which are only medieval, which means that her burial could not have been a Roman period sacrifice for the wall. Now, the results of the 1992 investigation at Lowbury Hill and the accompanying fines analysis allowed Fulford and his team to formally reassess the nature and duration of the Roman activity at Lowbury Hill. This analysis relied heavily on the coins and these odd spearheads that we've got. Now, these were found by Atkinson, and as you can see, each of them has one or more alterations that would make them basically useless as a weapon. You couldn't hurt anyone with these, or you'd have a hard time trying. Now, as you can see, two, this one, and this one, have knobs affixed to the top like this. So the, the point is, is no. Um, and the, this one has holes short on the side, and there's one ring attached to This one probably has something similar, but it is damaged, so it's quite hard to tell. And the third had this metal crescent or hoop attached to the top. So the examination of these coins and these spearheads, and several other finds from the site, especially animal bones, led Fulford and his team determined that Lowbury Hill must have served as a late Iron Age and Roman ritual site from the 1st to late 4th or early 5th centuries AD, uh, stating, on the evidence of the quantity and certain characteristics of the artifacts discussed above, the evidence of the faunal assemblage, and the structural evidence from the 1992 excavation, we have no difficulty in proposing that Lowbury was the site of a Romano-Celtic temple. And that's where we begin to run into some problems. As we've already mentioned, we haven't found the temple building yet. We haven't found, found an altar. And <coughs> without either of those, we can't really confirm that the site hosted either a temple or an altar. On the same vein, Lowbury really lacks a lot of the clear cut examples of the telltale small finds we often associate with Roman temples. And these, for example, include curse tablets, like we've got here. And if you've been to Bath, you'll have seen loads of these in a display case. Um, we've got miniature votive weapons, like this one here. It's a miniature axe. And some of these were found at Uli. And we've also got votive plaques. Now, nothing like this really was found at Lowbury Hill. So again, that sells us, uh, is it a temple? Now, the closest we come at Lowbury Hill are those weird spearheads we just looked at. Um, in my research, I found that these are pretty similar to iron objects that we interpret as spearheads, but they're called beneficari spearheads, or ritual spearheads, or hastipuri, so off the spears of power, basically, signs of power. Um, and these are from the continent, to the European continent more broadly. Any in Britain have been so far diagnosed, or identified rather, at rituals, ritual objects, ritual spearheads. Um, the Beneficari spears, broadly defined, as I said, as ceremonial spears, are made of iron. They often had perforations and or rings, like ours. Um, and they were used by members of the Roman military on special duty. This included tax collection and law enforcement in a world where they didn't have just police like we have today. Anyone doing a policing duty was usually someone in the military or a local governor or administrator serving that role temporarily. Um, so in this scenario, these all little spearheads might have been used as a badge of office to denote status to say, at this moment, we are serving as the police, as a tax collector. Now, this is not to completely derail the ritual idea of Lowbury Hill. Um, sacred space in the ancient world was not as co-delineated as it is today. We stand in a church, we know that it's a church. Um, but that might not have been the case in the Roman world. We know that roadside shrines were extremely common. Wells were used to ritual foci after they stopped being used for drawing water. Um, households had small shrines to the lares or the household gods, much like you might have a crucifix in your home today. Um, and graffiti and protective jewelry remind us that the gods were very much a part of everyday life and they were everywhere in the Roman world. And they can be invoked anywhere at any time and for any reason. So with this in mind, I have no problem at all, except that Lowbury Hill hosted some kind of ritual activity. 
but I'm not yet willing to accept the site and sites of a simple, similar nature, because there are several, as temples, until we find the temple building, if we find the temple building. So, some alternate explanations. Since the early 2000s, and a little bit before, but really picking up at the turn of the century, scholars studying Roman Britain have started to stress the narrative that rural sites hitherto identified as temples or sanctuaries may have served additional or alternate functions. Now, full free weapon do make a nod to this, but it isn't fully explored. So, it's generally accepted now that both Fulford and Wood Eaton Roman temples may have functioned not only as temples, but as central points for rural gathering and exchange. Due to their location along administrative boundaries, so between the civitates, um, and scholars now focus on these sites as potential locales for tax collection, legal hearings, and reading of the laws and uh, temporary markets and fairs. Um, Luke DeLake is a historian who suggests on the basis of inscriptions from Boeotia in Greece and in Italy, that temples may have served as sites for periodic markets or fairs. This theory, as I said, is gaining traction in the wider scholarship, and there have been several case studies of phenomenon in North Africa, and people are beginning to accept that similar practice may have taken place elsewhere in the Roman world, including Britain. Closer to home, for many of us, John Naylor and Annie Byard at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford are in the process of publishing a site situated near Segsbury Camp as a shrine and tax collection point. Now, hopefully that will be out at around 2025, last I heard from John, so we'll have that to look forward to. And it's against this background that I believe Lowbury Hill, which was located along one of these administrative boundaries in Roman, medieval, and modern times, luckily enough for us, may more accurately be identified as one of these central points, which offered rural inhabitants the Berkshire Downs and surrounding areas, a place to hold periodic markets, to pay their taxes, to interact with the Roman state, and yes, potentially to undertake ritual activity. Now, if Lowbury Hill did serve as a market, we might not see very much evidence of that, apart from the fines, things you'd want to buy um, if you were a rural farmer or someone living out of the town. Um, and that's because market structures, like this table here, don't necessarily have to be permanent. Um, many of the awnings and tables like this would have been brought for the day, set up, and taken down and taken away, like you might see at a modern farmer's market today. And if this is the case with the way the soil is at Lowbury Hill and the quick draining matter manner of it, without any stone flooring, we wouldn't see any wear patterns from this. There would be nothing, apart from maybe some nails, which we have plenty of. So this is a possibility. Now, some of you may recognize this photo. Since 1992, research from the site has slowed significantly. Most scholarship is focused on these two burials, and we haven't really learned much more about them despite this. Um, I'm not including those of the human remains, A, when I'm still studying them, and because I think it's impolite to do so without warning in advance. <laughs> um, so, studies of our Lowbury lady still regularly consider her as a victim of human sacrifice and or a Celtic mutilation ritual. And this narrative is often a little confused, oddly enough. Um, at least one recent publication from 2019 still considering her to be Roman in date despite the radiocarbonates we discussed here that are widely published and available. Now, other scholars have really focused on the damage to her skeleton, which as far as I can tell looking at her bones occurred after burial, um, to argue that she had her facial bones removed as part of an early medieval Celtic ritual sacrifice. The lack of scholarly engagement with her and the persistence of these incorrect interpretations really highlights the problems with the existing discourse to the unfair treatment of both individuals with a little bit odd, unfurnished, unexpected styles of graves, but also women in early medieval studies. They're really left out. Um, as you might have noticed, the men, especially the men with nice graves and nice things in their graves, get a lot more attention, as is the case for a lowbury man. Now, his burial hasn't been really carbon dated, but it has been dated on the basis of his grave goods. And we think he was buried sometime between 610 and 685 AD. 
So stable isotope analysis was done by Harriet Bryant Buck, a master's student at Cranford at the time, and that revealed that he lived either in Cornwall or Western Ireland during his childhood. And scholarly research on him has consistently viewed him as an elite male, a warrior burial. And he, and all of his grave goods, are usually on display at the Oxfordshire Museum in Woodstock, which is why I've got this lovely image site here. Now, he's temporarily off display. You may have seen the press on that. And he'll be back 12th of December. I'll be putting him back in his case. But for right now, I've got him. I'll be looking at his bones to hopefully come back later in the year or next year and give you a brand new lecture about what we found out. Um, so his burial on Lowbury Hill has been studied quite in what, quite a lot of detail, and it's been linked to the site's location, which would have been at the time of his burial on one of the border zones between Mercia and Wessex. Um, it's been linked to the site's Roman heritage and the views from Lowbury Hill over the surrounding landscape. Remember those seven counties we named? That would have been a really <coughs> prestigious place to be buried. Um, it is important, however, just now to note the identification of this man as a warrior burial doesn't necessarily mean he was a soldier or a warrior. Warrior or weapons burials are generally considered as a status symbol, not a direct identifier of occupation. And in his case, by the time he died, he suffered from quite severe arthritis. He had a wounded arm. Uh, he had broken a collarbone that had been healed quite badly and not quite back in place. So he would have likely been in a lot of pain or it would have been completely impossible for him to wield a sword or a spear. So you can probably imagine that he was not fighting at the time of death. So the title of warrior is maybe more of a symbol of respect in this scenario. Now, whilst academic research from the site may have slowed down since 92, in the intervening decades since Wolf and Rippon's dig, public interest, as we can all attest today, has really grown. Um, and I wanted to take the remaining time I have with you to discuss the site from a public perspective as a destination, an inspiration, and a resource for each and every one of us to enjoy. So today, as we all probably know, Lowbury Hill is a really popular hiking destination. Several people, some of whom are in the room today, have documented their hikes, their runs, their cycle trips on social media up on Lowbury Hill. You'll see photos, you'll have the site tagged. Um, and the trick point on the site shown here, that was a terrible circle, <laughs> um, and attracted loads of trick pointers. Uh, these are individuals who document their adventures to, to try to find trick points around the country, which is a really interesting hobby. Uh, that one that I've not had a chance to look into in much detail, but after this, I'm hoping to, maybe once I have more time. <laughs> there have also been some guided walks to the site, some of which were organized in the past uh, as part of Anna Dillon and Hedley Thorne's uh, art exhibit, but also more recently, this month, we've had some as part of this month of events. So the Oxford Museum Service and Goring Library have organized two, one of which has already passed. Um, but one, which some of you may be booked in to attend, is going to take place on the 12th. Um, and as we kind of already brought up, artists such as Hadley Thorne and Anna, who's here today, who we've seen a few times already throughout this presentation, frequent the site as an inspiration. But these types of sojourns are not new, as the advert here shows. Now this is, this here, it's a very blown up section of this, so you can actually read it in the back, I hope. Um, so this is showing that Smith's luxury coaches and cars out of Reading used to offer afternoon coach trips to Lowbury Hill as of 1937. Um, and later, in 1992, the site was visited by some well-known motorcycle enthusiasts, as we'll see later, if everything works. <laughs> um, and in fact, we can see Lowbury Hill serving as a really important local fo focal point from the 19th century onwards. Now, many of us will already know this. In 1887, Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee was celebrated around the world, and beacons were lit on Lowbury Hill. Now, I doubt any of them were the size of this beacon. Um, <laughs> This photo was preserved, the People's Collection for Wales. They don't actually say where it is, but we're pretty sure it's not on Lowbury Hill. <laughs> um, so, the bonfires that were held on the site did leave archaeological traces, however. Atkinson, as you can see partially in the quote here, noted several burnt stake holes and layers of burnt soil. While later, in the 1992 dig by Fulford and Rippon, 
It was reported that the heated soil that was a result of these fires caused several anomalies visible in the geophysical survey results, um, which have been very problematic for our interpretations. Now, as is demonstrated by the case of Liberty Hill, fire can damage even hidden archaeological remains and affects the soil in such ways to make electric and magnetic results, you have false results, which will show modern day fire pits instead of archaeological features. And this is one of the many, many reasons why bonfires, barbecues, anything that might heat soil in that manner is completely, completely prohibited on scheduled monuments today. Now, some of you may not have known this part. In 1914, King George V made a personal visit to Lowbury Hill during a troop inspection of the local Berkshire troops in the First World War. We don't have an image of his visit to Lowbury Hill, at least if we do, I haven't been able to find one just yet. Um, I do imagine that he was dressed rather similarly as he is here. It's a quite dashing uniform, in fact. Um, this picture is from a later troop inspection, circa 1920, in Aldershot. The Barks and Oxon advertiser from October 9th, 1914, reports that His Majesty then rode on to Lowbury Hill. Here, on Mr. L. G. Slade's land, he watched the endless squadrons canter by as they proceeded to execute field maneuvers over the expansive Churn Basin. Now, this visit by George V demonstrates not only that Lowbury Hill remained a viable and apparently ideal option for public gatherings, such as those we kind of said might have happened in the Roman period, but it also reinforced the martial interpretations of the site that at the time this occurred were current. At this point, we still thought the site may have been a Roman military camp, so it makes sense that he might have had a military event there. Yeah. Following the precedent that was set during the time of his paternal grandmother, George V's 1935 Silver Jubilee, Silver Jubilee celebration also resulted on a in a beacon at Lowbury Hill. This time, however, they learned their lesson, or not, um, and placed the bonfire instead of directly on the soil into a crescent. Maybe like the one we can see here, something similar, a fire basket. Um, this crescent was reportedly loaded with the following items. Sacking, waste, sections of rubber tires, and strontium, which would have made the flames red. Uh, the whole of which was then moistened with paraffin and motor sump oil. Now, this information, along with the crowd estimate of about 150 people, was reported again by the Barks and Oxen Advertiser from May 16th, 1935. Interestingly, no comment was made as the stench this fire must have produced, burning rubber and burnt oil, and we can all imagine that, I'm sure, though. <laughs> um, more than 30 years later, and a year, pictured here, complained that the crescent that was set up for George V's Jubilee was still in place, disfiguring the hill. And I'm going to quote from her, a lecture that she delivered at the university, saying as much. Now, this crescent has since been removed and no longer disfigures the hill. I have looked and looked and been completely unable to find any reports as to when this may have happened. So if anybody in the audience knows, I would be delighted to hear about it. Um, now, as we see, Lowbury Hill has served both to host and celebrate British royals, but it has also provided that inspiration to artists, poets, and people like you and I who are all here today. Now, this is Roland Matthias, a well-known Welsh writer who sadly passed away in 2007. But before he died, he authored a poem titled Lowbury Hill, which was published in his 1946 poetry collection, Break and Harvest. Now, we're very lucky today to have my PhD advisor, Professor Amy Smith, here tonight, who's going to give us a reading of his poem for all of us to enjoy. And I won't give away any more of it than the already been quoted in the slide, but I would like to invite you all to stay a little bit beyond our scheduled runtime so you can hear her reading, and I find the poem quite moving, though it's a bit jarring. Every time I read it, I notice different references to Lowbury Hill and the history of Lowbury Hill much of which I've covered in lecture today, so hopefully you'll get to notice some of the different strands of history. Um, and I hope you can have that similarly informed experience. It is worth also, when you do here, noting Matthias's use of environmental imagery, much of which you can still witness firsthand if you go up the site 
in the correct season. Now, as promised earlier in this lecture, I have included a very short clip from the series of Ridge Riders, which is a documents a uh, motorcycle enthusiast visit to Lowbury Hill, and which I sincerely hope will play for you in a moment. If not, you'll see me fiddling with the computer. Um, this episode, which is part of a series aired by ICB Meridian, doesn't really actually show the hill, but it does show several objects that you might have seen in person if you visited the Woodstock Museum, uh, the Oxfordshire Museum in Woodstock. And while this dialogue is interesting, it is somewhat out of date with our knowledge of the site today. And to my knowledge, no one has discovered the mentioned spring on Lowbury Hill. But enough tarmac for the time being. Back on the high chalk, we have a date with the curator of the Downham Museum, Emily Leach, who's been digging at nearby Lowbury Temple. Lowbury is unusual because it's a place where there was a spring, and of course, as I'm sure you know, there's not much water up here on the Ridgeway. Um, and people came along and, and, and put what we call votive offerings down into the well or, or into um, where the spring was coming out of the ground. Sort of gift for the gods. Some, gifts for the gods, yes. Yeah. Some, right. some of these things are brooches. Um, and this is a little bit of a, a bone pin that's been, uh, that's been, been carved. carved. Yeah. yeah, it's got, it's really rather lovely. This is a spearhead, a Roman spearhead that was um, found up there at Lowbury. And again, I think it shows the continuity of people living over several hundred years. So Roman soldiers were there, and then Saxon warriors came in. <laughs> so what sort of people would the Romans be poking that into then? I mean, who would they I be should think unruly Britons, about? really. Really? Unruly Britons. But uh, a lot of this stuff dates from about the second century AD, and the Romans have been here for a couple of hundred years already. So um, really, things were fairly quiet. I guess you could uh, say this is the equivalent of a policeman's baton, perhaps, or <laughs> truncheon. What was interesting about Lowbury was that it was uh, an Iron Age temple site before the Romans were there, and then after the Romans left, when they all withdrew in 410 AD, um, ah, the Saxons, 410. 410 AD, <laughs> yes, I'm sure you, yes, a date familiar, very familiar to you, um, the Saxons came along. And uh, I don't think the Saxons used it as a, um, a religious site, but this uh, strange-looking object <laughs> is... Saxon blancmange mold. Oh, that's, well, that's one. <laughs> um, is the centre of a shield. So it's oh. a shield boss. And uh, it rather implies that there were some soldiers up there. I will play this again for you with the speaker or a speaker working. Um, I don't know why it didn't work, but I will recap briefly what she said. So she repeated the temple narrative for this site at the time was thought to have been used as a temple from the first century AD to 410 AD. Um, and she brought some site, some of the objects from the site along with her. You might have seen Angie's face when she pulled out the shield balls. We would never do that today. <laughs> <laughs> you, but you can see them on display. Now, on hearing that again really, really quietly, I also just noticed that one of the things she said, the Romans stopped using the site at 410 AD, isn't really current. Um, now, most archaeologists accept that Roman life in Britain didn't end 410 as a sh short, sharp shock. We think it continued on for probably the next half century while declining and the culture began to change. Uh, as a further aside, now, this didn't really show the motorbiking, but they did Rhine's Ridgeway Trail on motorbikes. Um, that's now mostly prohibited. There are sections of the Ridgeway National Trail that you can ride a motorbike on at certain times of year. The section near Slowbury Hill, I believe, is subject to a traffic re regulation order, which makes that legal. <laughs> now, of note also, I find, one of the bikes ridden during this series is still available for purchase today. Uh, is worth over £100,000. So you can imagine riding that on the Ridgeway, if you'd like, gives me anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> now, moving on to quieter ways of enjoyment. I want to take a few moments to highlight work by two of the artists that I had an extreme pleasure of working with over the past year and a bit. All the photographs here, and some shown earlier, are taken by Hadley Thorne, who has a wonderful eye and unfortunately couldn't be with us here today. All the paintings that are running through 
uh, our Anna Dillon, who is here with us today. Luckily, I didn't know she was coming, so I was quite excited to see her. And she is obviously an incredible artist. And whenever I'm getting a little tired of research, I look at her paintings and I'm enthused to start all over again. Now, both Headley and Anna do have some artwork currently on display in Goring Library. So if you haven't gone, I would really encourage you to go because my slides and projector do not do them justice whatsoever. Um, but these artworks are by no means the only ones that Lowbury Hills inspired. Many visitors to the site sketch the hill and its views, myself included, but you'll never see my sketches. Uh, they've had their own skill to comparison. <laughs> I hope that artists do continue to take inspiration from Lowbury Hill and the surrounding landscape and create artworks for us all to enjoy. If any of you are interested in doing so, I think some of you may have signed up, there is a Lion Collage workshop being run as part of a series of events. Um, that's run by Jane Dipple on the 12th of November, and will give you a chance to produce an artistic response to Anna and Hadley's work, as well as their own artifacts that are on display in the library. But you can also go up the hill on your own with a sketch pad or a camera and make your own responses in real life, plein air style, out in the wilderness, as it were. <laughs> Now, Angie, if you want to start singing for sides, now is the time. I want, now that we trace the history of Lowbury Hill from the 19th century until today, we can start to look forward to what the site has to offer next, the future of the site for us. From a personal perspective, I'm hoping to improve our understanding of the hill and fill in some of the blanks of holiday today. Over the next few years, I'll reassess the Roman and early medieval or Anglo-Saxon site at Lowbury Hill to better understand its use, and see that the marketplace suggestion actually holds up under scrutiny. I, for one, hope it does. That may not be the case. We'll all find out together. Um, I also aim to reinterpret the early medieval female burial and develop an understanding, a deeper, greater understanding of her life and death. So some initial results for you as a teaser for the next lecture we're going to do. Um, I've not found any evidence whatsoever that she died a violent death. Um, all the damage to her bones that I have found was quite old for the most part. It was caused by the compressive force of the earth in which she was buried, and some was caused during her initial discovery by Atkinson's workmen, who unfortunately fractured her skull with a tool. Um, but quite minimal damage as far as it goes. Uh, further analysis of her bones is in the plans. I'm doing some isotope testing and some ADNA testing, which we hope, with some luck, will tell us much more about her. So where she lived, what she ate, what her ancestry was, and maybe we'll reveal any diseases she might have had in life that can be discovered through the use of ADNA. Um, I also hope, as I said, to deliver some follow-up lecture, a follow-up lecture on the results of these findings in the future, and I hope to see each and every one of you there again. Um, before I hand over to Angie, I want to take a moment to thank every one of you for coming out tonight and for your enthusiasm for this site. Um, throughout every stage of this research, the library team's research to date, not just myself, but Songmi, Amy, Angie, Sophie, all of us have been really supported and encouraged by local communities around the site, which is extremely gratifying and comforting as an archaeologist to have that support, to have the locals behind us encouraging us and spurring us on. Um, but really, the true future of the site comes down to you. Um, Library Hill and how it progresses into hopefully the next several centuries will be determined by site visitors, by locals, by artists, by anyone who is lucky enough and willing to let the site impact their lives. Um, and as long as everyone continues to stay engaged and interested in Library Hill, it's going to continue to show up in the academic research, in the public-facing media, in art, in outreach events, and a destination for us to all go for a relaxing walk on the Ridgeway. Thank you so much for having me. asking somebody could they next slide please like they did in the lockdowns. Right, well I'm going to focus on some of the objects, but I'm going to focus more on the Roman objects than the early medieval ones. Partly because I quite like the Roman ones and they're packed away, they're not often on display until they're on display in the Gauling Library. Also we have with the Saxon material, they're on display at the Oxfordshire Museum and they get enough attention. So this is just a quick sort of 
look at some of these objects. So the history of the collection. The Atkinson archive came to the Oxfordshire Museum Service. It was transferred from the Reading um, University in 1986. And the Fulford excavation archive was deposited with us in 1995. With additional paperwork slipped in in 2021, I found these in my office when I was having a tidy. <laughs> Mike Fulford's own um, words. So it's been enhanced more recently. But when we're talking about archives, we're, what we're actually talking about is the documents that come, um, were used, so the site notes, the site diaries, the plans that were made of the excavations, the notes and specialist reports on the objects, on the pottery, the animal bone, that all comes to us. Am I going to hit the right button? Yeah. So they stored in these sort of document archive boxes um, at the Museum Resource Centre at Stand Lake. Along with them come the publications. So this is Atkinson's <coughs> publication on his excavations. And then also the finds. So this is just an example of the metalwork, just one small box of some of the metalwork and how it's packed and stored in our metalwork store. We don't have a lot of pottery from these sites. That wasn't really deposited with us. A sample was, but we don't have the full amount. If it were excavated today, you tend to deposit the whole lot. So then people in a few years' time can look at it and reinterpret it, not just rely on what was said in, say, Atkinson's report. So for the Lowbury Hill, we have 1,168 records on our data management system from Lowbury Hill. There's more objects than that because one bag, for example, will have 37 Roman coins unidentified. So, but that'll count as one record. So we'll start with the coins then. So go have a look at those coins in the library because you will see them a lot better. So the coins, there are 727 identifiable Roman coins. And um, in total, there's about nearly 800 coins. So I'll just talk about the identifiable coins here. And so what we've done is they've been identified and then the proportion of coins have been put into these time periods. So these are called Rees periods after Richard Rees, the Roman numismatist. So he's divided the Roman period into, say, 60, 69 to 96, the Flavian time, and you can see the proportions of the time. And some are mentioned that sort of traditionally you can compare this pattern of coin loss from different sites. But when you look at this pattern of coin loss, you will see a similar pattern on Roman villas, you will see a similar pattern on temple sites, you will see a similar pattern on farmstead types. You're coming up here, we've got our first coins in that mid first century, time just bounces on, but now we're getting into the late third, fourth century and the number of coins being lost on Lowbury Hill are a lot more. So you might look at that and think, ah, oh, that enclosure, that square enclosure that some has been talking about, was really busy in the late 3rd, 4th century. It might be true, but also there's lots more in the story of Roman coins. Roman coins at this time, you will have denominations, for example, called denarii, they're silver coins. <coughs> you get a, you, with those coins, you're buying a lot more the value is a lot more, it's the equivalent of our notes today. By the time the economy is going on and the emperors are struggling, they start eking out that silver, they're putting more bronze into their coins. By the time you get to the late 3rd and 4th century, there's no silver in the coins. But people aren't daft, they're not going to... When you're buying your bread, the bakers are sort of, well, that coin's hard to get the silver on, I want at least four of those coins. So now the Roman Empire is churning out 
these late 3rd, 4th century coins, and they're millions to try and keep the economy going. So this is one reason why we see far more coins in the late 3rd, 4th century. It doesn't mean it's an extra busy time at Lowbury Hill during this time. There's lots of nuances and subtleties, but people like um, Summer are going to draw out more. They're going to look at all the objects as a whole. That's as, as interesting as I could make Roman, Roman coins be, okay? <laughs> I could talk a lot more, but I will stop there because then you will um, blaze over. But go look at those coins. Look at the portraiture that you have. These earlier coins, the, the uh, bust looked like the emperor. So truly, go and have a look at them. When you get to the late 3rd, 4th century, they look slightly cartoon-like. The 4th century ones are like um, Homer Simpson. <laughs> Go have a look. Sorry, did you have a... Well, um, you're talking about that, what that, those coins mean. Why do you think there is a, a massive number in 364 sort of thing, and then nothing? Would that indicate um, that they stopped using this art. It might be. That there's, these are really common in that late 4th century, the House of Valentinian, the coins are being produced. These coins then, in the Theodosian the I, start to be made of silver. The, the emperors revised the denomination, so they start to be made of silver again, and far less. But if you know, if you drop a £10 note, well, I will. I'll be looking really hard for it. If you drop your silver coin, you look really hard for it. If you drop one of your Tetricus first bronze coins, <laughs> came a bit of a rush, you don't look for it. So we're looking at the coin loss, and I think that's the explanation why. Unless someone tells us different in a year <laughs> or two's time. <laughs> so I'm standing here with the, these are my ideas, theories, imaginations but some of will hopefully tell us a bit more. So a broad overview of the metalwork that we have in our collection from Lowbury Hill. And I haven't included the unidentified things in here. I haven't un um, included some of the weapons. But really to illustrate, we have, hold on, where's the button? A lot of objects, bright yellow here, are personal accessories. It's the jewellery, it's the decoration. This is the ox cleats. Remember those iron prods for the cattle? We have nine, just over 19, I think, of those in our collection. It seems quite a large amount. It just, I didn't include an image because they're really boring iron, iron spirals with a spike on the end. But we've got here, so this is the one object that's potentially votive religious connotations is the head of a china cockerel and i haven't included an image because when you look at it it looks like it could have been made in 1920 i can't quite believe it's roman so i've ignored it so let me stick with the interesting things so brooches oh i've lost my drink yeah. <coughs> so looking at brooches, so our earliest brooches on Lowbury Hill are in that very, very late Iron Age, early Roman period. So sort of 100 um, BC to sort of mid 1st century AD. And these brooches are made of one piece and they're just like the safety pins we use today. Just picture those. So you can see the decorative bow here, the spring, and your pin would come down. Ah, here's an example. You've got your pin there coming down. And we see those relatively often in Oxfordshire. People like to be decorated, decorating themselves in Oxfordshire. If I was stood in Warwickshire and Worcestershire, we don't often see such brooches. In those counties, they were decorating their horses and vehicles more than they were themselves. But the Oxfordshire people, you like to decorate yourselves. So we see these sort of brooches. And the style develops into the mid, um, in the mid uh, first into the second century. And we have the more sort of what's looked at as Roman brooches, the more robust brooches here. 
And these two, these three, sorry, are all found at Lowbury Hill. This is a trumpet, and these called trumpet style brooches, <coughs> these two, and I think this one's a Hod Hill bridge. But again, Lowbury Hill or Oxfordshire, the most common type of Roman brooch in Oxfordshire is called the Polden Hill type. And this is a Polden Hill type. Where's my gadget here? This is a Polden Hill type here. Now, Polden Hill is in Somerset. It was just given that name because somebody first found it and shouted loudest and said, I declare the Polden Hill type. Um, actually, it's manufactured along the <coughs> Severn Valley. So this is a distribution of Polden Hill type brooches. You can tell I used to work in the West Midlands. Right, this gap here is Birmingham. Do you see? I used to say it to the West Midlands audience so you can orientate yourself. But I'm now stood in Oxfordshire. Yeah, you're all down here, aren't we? But we, Polden Hill are still quite um, common brooches in Oxfordshire. Meth detector users are finding them and recording them all the time. But I can't see one from Lowbury Hill. Now, is it because people are travelling from the east part of the um, country to Lowbury Hill? We're not getting much movement from the west. And again, that's my fanciful idea. I have that's as much evidence as I've got for that airy-fairy idea. It'd be people like Summer, whose shoulders really that curators stand on to tell the true, more definite story, rather than my sort of slight dreaming story and wondering and ponderings. Yes? I've got a prejudice in my head which I want to correct. Are, are these <laughs> feminine or are these unisex? So unisex. So these brooches would be worn in pairs and you would buy your cloak and you would buy them with the brooches on there. So they're used as our fastenings. If I actually looked at my notes, I would remember to have said this. <laughs> but they're used as fastenings, worn in pairs. Now traditionally, archaeologists always illustrate them this way round with the spring up here. But there's evidence that they were worn the other way round because I've got a replica Polden Hill brooch I would have coming from the West Midlands. I was going to wear it, but I forgot with wiping up a puppy's wee and things and <laughs> pushing it out the door. But they're really heavy, and if you wear it this way round, it just leans forward, and you're sort of throwing it back. It's quite a weighty thing. But if you wear it upside down, it sits quite nicely. But even knowing that, there's still the archaeologist in me that goes for convention, <laughs> um, wears it like this, um, um, illustrates them like this. So it's just, but we're getting a variety of brooches. But again, there's this tradition that um, temple sites, you get a lot of personal items. Well, if these brooches are worn in pairs, they're at meeting places, you're going to lose a lot of brooches. And think of the Roman period. So the, Think of the Iron Age period. All the metalwork in the Iron Age period, particularly that very late Iron Age period, is artisan metalwork. They're carefully crafted. The Romans, it's mass manufacture. They're churning out these objects, the huge quantity of objects that we're now seeing. It's like today, you know, we produce that industry, churning out these things. And so it may be that's one of the reasons why we're seeing such high quantity material. And also the pins break really easily. We see a lot of repairs on some of these brooches. They are easily lost. And then these are the more brooches that we wear similar to date. So these are second century brooches. But you would wear them tend to be singularly and as decoration. And so you would have enamel in these cells. Whoops, hold on, wrong button. Enamel in these cells here, and again over here. This one probably had a glass um, boss in the centre, dark glass boss in the centre as decoration, and again, we would have had enamel in here. But they would have looked striking, they would have looked vibrant with their enamel. And if you think the bronze would have looked that sort of yellow colour, they would have been far more glamorous than what we're depicting here. Were they all made in one place or in lots of places? We don't really know. So we certainly think we've got, so like with the Polden Hill brooch and these brooches, 
we've got hot spots of area where they must have been manufactured and coming out. We do know that some of the brooches would have been made on the continent because if you look at the continent, they will have far more, I think it's this brooch, is possibly either continentally influenced or made on the continent because you can see they, they've got a lot more. But there's more research that needs to be done. There's more evidence that we need to find. We need to find. So when you're making a Roman brooch, you make the bold outline of, if I go back to my Polden Hill, <coughs> my trusty Polden Hill, you make a bold outline in lead, and that's your lead pattern. Around your lead pattern, you make the clay mould from it, two-piece mould. Um, you're then able to put a bit apart, fire the mould, and then you reuse the mould. And we found two lead patterns, oops, wrong button, two lead patterns in Worcestershire of the Polden Hill brooch. So we know, or certainly that's strong evidence that they're manufacturing them in that area. Chadley called it near Kidderminster. Um, but look at the concentration. So Chadley Corbett is just around here, if I could hold my hand still. Um, but they're manufacturing them, but you can see where we think they're manufacturing them. But if you look at the dates of coins, so you've got the coins here, it's the slide I showed you earlier. Ignore the number of brooches. I was just wanting to get across. Brooches tend to date to that first, second century. But we know that brooches continue to be found in later contexts. Even though the brooch is perhaps manufactured up to here, they're continuing to be found on M sites and excavations into the fourth century. They're reused, they're past, potentially passed down as heirlooms. Um, and that might be why also we're starting to see the large quantities of brooches um, that they are being passed down. And one of the, another object of potential for that use is fingerings. And again, the, all of these are from Lowbury Hill, and you'll see some of them on display in the library. There's a large quantity of fingerings, but again, at the back of your mind, have the Roman brooches, uh, Romans are churning out mass production of these objects. A lot of them are made of bronze. So, you know, it's the sort of lower end of the market, but not everybody would be able to afford them. Now, these two are formerly Roman bracelets, but they've been recycled into finger rings. And these, they fit on your finger nicely. I haven't tried these ones on, but when I used to work as a Fines Liaison Officer, so that's a um, work of a meta detector users, so meta detectorists would find these. Oh, Angie, what do you think? Try it on. It's not all it fits very nicely. They're really, really comfy. <laughs> so yes, I can attest that these are finger rings, but they're made from Roman braces, but they're recycled. It may be, and again, I'm starting to go into sort of fanciful thinking. Are they an important <coughs> object in a family? And that bracelet perhaps is cut and made into finger rings and shared between siblings? Is it that somebody's just lost the bracelet, another person's found it, and they've just rolled it up? and we used it. But you're sort of getting a longer life, potentially a longer life cycle. Now we have finger rings here with an intaglio. So the intaglio is a stone or gem setting that's been engraved. I think this intaglio is in the library at the moment. And they would often have um, motifs or symbols of gods um, or of a, a, a scene or a design sort of um, related to the Roman, Roman world. And again, it might be like a status item. Perhaps you're showing your sophistication of relying yourself to the Roman influences. You know, you've shrugged off that Iron Age Celtic design. And again, I'm getting my fanciful um, ideas, but it's for people that are doing research, sort of summer and sort of see on me, but we get these more definite stories from. We have to make these collections accessible to researchers, 
but also accessible to yourselves. Bring out these collections from the stores into the places that you're visiting. And then finally, the sort of Roman pins with the decoration. Now, as a fine liaison officer, when you're working with metal detector users, they never bring in pins because they're just so fine and so small. And metal detector users are in the plough soil. So now I'm a curator and we see all these pins. It's brilliant. And we have bone pins. So you can see the sort of three <coughs> bone pins here. But again, they're starting to give us clues on the changing fashions in the Roman period, the more sophisticated hairstyles that you use pins for. It's just all these glimpses into life that we get to see and the questions that um, it brings about. And also the Roman influence. We have toilet items here. So we've got the tweezers. We've got ear scoops, you know, it's the equivalent of a cotton wool, but um, nail cleaners. We don't see these sort of objects in the Iron Age period. You can see now the influence that the Romans are having and what is being left behind on Lowbury Hill. And just the style of tweezers hasn't changed, has it? Um, but we see, sometimes it's really hard to tell what's a Roman tweezer compared to an early medieval tweezer or a medieval. They all look the same unless they're decorated. But yes, the ear scoops. So here you can just see the little paddle on the end. And it's commonly thought of as ear scoops. When you look at them, you can sort of imagine them. But also another sort of thought is they could be a small spoon for makeup. So I don't know. I'm liking the ear scoop sort of scenario, <laughs> personally. And then Summer has already talked about the spearhead. So this is the spearheads, the, like, the ceremonial objects. Or, and I was trying to think what I would equate these, because they're not the weaponry. Not unless they're practice ones for an apprentice with these novels on the end. But it's the sort of the mayoral chains. It's that symbol of power. Is it a symbol of a role that somebody's playing in society? I will leave the Romans there. We've given you a taster. And when I sat down to start this talk and sort of prepare it, because I was thinking, oh, I'll just do 10, 15 minutes at the end of your talk, Summer. I could carry on and on and on, so I'll, I'll stop there. But just a quick glance at the early medieval period. And we do have the Anglo-Saxon gallery at the Oxfordshire Museum in Woodstock. And it is worth going to see. Of course, I would say that. But even if I weren't <laughs> employed by the museum service, I would say just go and see. You can see how he is laid out with his objects. And so we have... Oops, wrong way. So we have the hanging bowl here. You can see it's just fragments of the bowl that was laying on his side and that sort of nod to the Celtic design there. We have what we saw that lady handling with the bare hands, mm -hmm. the um, shield boss. <laughs> there, so that would be in the centre of the shield. I was going to say used as a prodder, but... A bit more than that, really, wouldn't it? Um, the sword, and again with the bronze decoration, and the spear that's decorated with enamel here. You can just see it here. It's just amazing to see a spear decorated with enamel. It's really, really unusual. And for the corrosion not to have covered it and the conservator to be able to spot it, but imagine that spear, it would have made of um, iron, it would have been glistening, shining, and then the bright red and yellow enamel with it, it would have been a striking object. And to make that object, the, the skill to do it, it wasn't just mass manufactured for all of us. Um, it would have been a particularly special object for a purpose. Right, I'm finally going to look at my notes. <laughs> Just, but I've given you sort of a whistle-stop tour of some of the ideas that we have with the objects, and you've seen the objects yourself, and you can then now go back to the library and have another look at them with my 
witterings in your ear and my, <laughs> my fanciful ideas. But what, you may have another idea. So somebody, um, I'm going off at a tangent, but we had a Iron Age comb. So it's a semicircular comb, really thick prongs. And I'm very smug because of West Midlands, it was found, I keep mentioning Kidderminster, but yeah, it was found in Kidderminster. And I think it's a curry comb for horses. If you compare it to a modern plastic one, purple one you find on Amazon, they're exactly the same shape, the dimensions between the teeth are the same. <coughs> so I think it's for horses, the West Midlands and the Iron Age, they love their horses. Um, Curators at the British Museum and a lot of other curators, no, 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 it's for personal use. It's, they go with the mirrors, Angie. And, anyway, they're wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> as giving a talk to an audience such as yourself, and somebody put their hand up and said, Oh, but have you thought it's exactly like the weaving comb I use? Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, Really, really? So she brought out the photo and it's like, Oh, yes. So it could be a curry comb or a weaving comb. Mm -hmm. But your ideas and your sort of fanciful thoughts are as valid as mine, and we'll share them together, but then some and Sion May are the people that are sort of telling us more what are the science behind it, what's the facts, and we can make our ideas even more fanciful then. <laughs> so it really, in conclusion, I think all the Lowbury Hill material is overdue a re-examination and to be reflected on and the interpretations um, that we have of the site so far. And I keep saying that as a curator I am standing on the shoulders of specialists, object specialists, researchers such as Sion May and um, Summer, the perhaps metal detector users that are working in the county, the field archaeologists. And I then retell these stories, be it in the galleries, coming out to places like this through other ex exhibitions. And that collaboration work is just vital, I think, for all of us. And the collaboration in our case with Lowbury Hill and Goring, for me, has included the Goring Library and Kate at the back, the Friends of Goring Library, who really have run with this whole idea. Roman yoga? Did anybody's children do <laughs> Roman <laughs> yoga? I thought that was good. Um, the collaboration of the University of Reading and the Cranfield University for having this research um, being carried out. But following the theme of what Summer has also said, we are all responsible for Lowbury Hill. So me as the curator for the objects, but for yourselves, you're the sort of guardians of Lowbury Hill because you live by it, you have an interest in it. You're keeping it alive by what you do, sort of walking up the hill and your interests. The landowner and the farmer are the custodians just at this moment in time. It will be somebody else in 500 years time, a thousand years time. And particularly for that landowner and farmer, we need to support them in protecting the site, so by respecting the rights of way around that site, um, reporting any what we think is illegal metal detecting. And so I'm going to put my old Fines Liaison Officer hat on here. So illegal metal detecting is if you don't have permission from the landowner, your illegal metal detector. But with Lowbury Hill, it's also classed as a scheduled ancient monument. So it's actually illegal to dig any holes in there and the landowner and the farmer have restrictions on what they can do on the land. So if you see what you think is a legal activity, don't approach the person because there are some <coughs> illegal detectorists who are not pleasant people. But they're very brazen, so they will do it in the daytime. It's not always at night time. But contact either myself or Ed Caswell, the Oxfordshire Fines Liaison Officer. I will let go of my old job and stop being a Fines Liaison Officer. Because he's the person who's working with metal detectors, but he has the connections with the police officers who do investigate it. But actually, be reassured that the police in this area do keep an eye on the Ridgeway and around here, because our curatorial assistant, uh, Lindsay, is a runner. She runs with a club in the area, and occasionally they have nighttime runs. Farming, 
So two in the morning, they'll run the Ridgeway. And I think about three in the morning, near Lowbury Hill, um, they got a flashing blue light and stopped. Because they've all got head torches. You can see them for miles bouncing down. And it was, um, the police stopped them and asked them what they were doing. And they were like, oh, we're we doing this run. And, um, and they said, why did you stop us? Oh, we're looking out for illegal metal detectors. Of course, Lindsay being Lindsay was like, oh, I know all about that. I'm the curatorial assistant. Yes, Lavery Hill. And they gave the whole running group a lecture about Lavery Hill. <laughs> <laughs> so, to, in the early hours of the morning. So, but if you've got any doubts, do get in contact with us, because there's subtle ways for us to sort of investigate further. But I wouldn't say approach them. But this is all our responsibility. You're living in this most amazing landscape. I mean, I'm living in Cheltenham. I've got my own Crickley Hill. I've got a hill fort that I'm looking at. But you've got Lowbury Hill. And so we need to help the landowner and farmers, the custodians. And we need to then keep it caring for it, but also keep adding to the story our events that we have there. So I'm hoping the equivalent of summer in... 500 years time, and like, yeah, there was this display of Goring Library, <laughs> this is part of it, there was guided walks up there, and we'll all become part of the Library Hill story. Uh, I would just like to finish off saying, well, thank you very much to Kate and the friends of um, Goring Library, and to yourselves for coming along, but also to Summer and Siong Bay and Amy, who are doing the research and sort of supporting us with these objects, and to yourselves for coming. It is very much appreciated, it is a joy. So I'm going to stop now and ask Amy to read the poem that um, Summer mentioned before. So, thank you, Angie. Um, very tough acts to follow. Um, it, it's possibly Matthias' longest poem in this book. Um, which is all on a rural theme because it's called Break and Harvest and other poems. Um, so I'm warning you, it's, it, it's longish, but it's going to be a drop in the ocean compared to, you know, <laughs> so, and, and it is called, appropriately enough, uh, Libri Hill. Comfort and centuries with broken feet lifts off this hill of recapture where meet interminable burns of fight mapping the brain. The rules of blood that maze and wall the site meet here. I gaze, and the spread blood goes back from the wall, runs hard into the hand, and the brain stops. Only the boundaries stand. A moment, and a cowardly kite, news from the clambering wood, ham wood the cloth maps have it, which at last sun could straddle the unconcern and flowers yellow on the interior common of the hours and blue with stragglers of Ancusa breaking out from the articulated garden of control. That sun saw the common whole, irreverent to the tumuli of blood and track of boot. Those trees converge in shadow, black years leap on the evolving flowers. All I can do to keep the decimal of sun recurring in one day, ringed with the body and the wood, fails. Centuries cry and blood. A speck, a half-life stops with fear. The mewing on the unfinished body bare goes on. The flecked, trenchant bailbird flying crosses the ring. The wood is Saxon, hamwood. Crime, haggard destruction, homeless flight in the slack eddy of the smoking night. The cold fair mile in face, the banded swathe, cut in bow, feel the Saxons scathe, is silent, dumb. Color and cattle drain from the pulmonic vein. Over the grass is Starval and the hill crawls down to unhill and the draining well. Smoke rises straight on the blue breeze like breath. Is it an axe I raise here in the Roman mounds? Help for my kin or surfeit of all wounds. Below on the slip, the flag, 
the red. Flight and the tank tracks run ahead of the older enemy in the blood. I know. I feel it. Red fear will make me mad. This air, this time of broken rule, is terrifying. Only the fool remains, the rooted, not to be banished broom on the surrounded common. Out of the body, then out yellow, make it a room for death. The axe and hands are here, the horn of kindred and the bear, body of the Christian dyke. Dart hands and damn the flood, our <coughs> body strike. <coughs> Woden has blessed you once and twice, Ambrosius. These great hearts enhance the honor of our blood and battery. Rage wind and carry smoke over the abandoned huts, the tattery banner book. Back goes the foam of faces, back the red wave. I lust now for the life I gave, I, more all this kin of bitten helms and bloodshot men, less for the forsworn life than for the bones left with the broom beside the swollen Thames. Down, Saxons, wait for wounds, we drive you cattle off the antlered hill. Wait for us, stumble. What we kill is only red with the spewed edge of our fear. These are the uncovered bounds of brotherhood, walls of the great reward. Clear are our points, like saint Juan on the slope, close to the dragon standard, blood to blood. Common the hope recurs. Kai has the cross, and the five wounds on Lidington above the foss. Here is king standing in our no hand, no less, over the broom our pride hangs in the moment, and the wave breaks wide in the future. Baden will bring the flood, blood to the unmapped heart to the torn heart tears. There will be comfort yet for 20 years. <laughs>